Uh, my name is Yossi Mualem. I'm a software developer at Fortinet. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is cache-friendly algorithms. So first of all, just to get our expectation aligned, what we're going to uh, try to do today is to talk about, analyze, and reason about uh, cache-related performance issues at source code level. Meaning we won't have profiling-guided optimization. We won't look at flame charts and all this sort of stuff. We're just going to look at the code, try to understand its cache behavior, and optimize it accordingly. The reason I chose to do that is, first of all, because I believe that that should be our first course of action. Whenever we want to optimize something, we should first um, look at the code, try to analyze it, and optimize this way. I found out that it yields much better results and much, much faster than all these other shiny tools. They have their place, we should use them, we should fami be familiar with them, but they should be uh, our last course of action. We should first try to analyze the code by source code level. Uh, the second reason is that, that I believe that if we'll train ourselves to uh, think about and reason about the cache behavior, we'll default into writing much better code by default, and therefore we may not even need this optimization. So if we want to talk about uh, cache behavior, we must scan some matrices, right? Because that's what everyone else is doing, uh, myself included. And I can see all of you thinking, oh no, not again, uh, major, row major versus column major versus random access versus constant stride. It's getting kind of boring listening to this again. So why are we all doing it? I want to talk about cache friendly algorithms, which is very nicely represented by this flower here. But normally before I talk about cache friendly algorithms, I need to talk about what cache is, why we need cache, and give some different background about cache. And if I'm giving some background about cache, we probably want to talk a bit about uh, cache maintenance and sharing. And if we're talking about sharing, why not drop a word or two about false sharing? And only because it's really small, and I think it's very really nice to talk about it. So by the end of this, all this background that I'm giving, I'm something like 30, 40 minutes into the, into the presentation, and this is the talk that we actually have. I want to talk about this flower there in the middle, and yes, it's still in the presentation somewhere, but it's definitely not the major thing. Sounds familiar, Avi? <laughs> Sounds familiar? Yeah. So I came up with an idea for this, and I'm just going to assume that we all know all this background, and therefore I don't need to explain it. Or better still, two years ago, or three years ago, I think, in the, in the first conference, in the first uh, Core C++ uh, conference, also in some other places, I gave a talk uh, titled Writing Software for Oil Hardware, uh, the C++ Memory Model, in which I discussed all of this background so let's just rename this uh, talk, Writing Software for Real Hardware Part 2, Cache Friendly Algorithms. And then all the background is Part 1, and if you want, you can look into it. So I don't need to, to repeat everything, but I can't go with saying nothing. So I want to spend the next five minutes, not really more than that, trying to build a mental model that we should hold when we think about cache algorithm and cache friendly algorithms. It will not be a complete, it will not be comprehensive, it will not be totally accurate mental model, but it's much better than the model that sometimes we hold of memory and CPU. So first of all, when I'm talking about memory access, I'm talking about data, data or code, it doesn't matter. In this presentation, I will concentrate on data only. So as you all know, we have the main memory, which is very, very big, but extremely slow. Because we don't want to always have to wait for data to arrive from the main memory into our CPU, we have cache. Not this sort of cache, that sort of cache. This cache is extremely, extremely fast, but it's also extremely small. The smallest cacheable unit that we have is called the cache line. On modern ar architecture, it's 64 or 128 bytes. And even if we want only one bit of data, we have to bring the whole cache line into our cache. If, our, uh, if the memory that we want is already in the cache, it's a cache hit, it's very, very fast, and we are very happy. If it's not in the cache, it's a cache miss, we have to bring it from the uh, main memory into our cache, and that's very, very slow, and we are very unhappy. 
So what we'll try to do is to minimize the amount of cache misses that we'll have. So let's look at a few code snippets and try to uh, estimate how many cache misses we'll have. We have a variable called value and we multiply it by two. We have no reasons to believe that it's already in our cache and therefore we have to assume that it's a cache miss. We now add one to it, we just touch this, so it's probably still in our cache line, and therefore we can very safely assume it's a cache hit. We execute a few more lines of code, and then we set this value to five. We cannot really say, looking at this, if it's a cache hit or a cache miss, it depends what hides behind this comment. If it's a very small amount of code, it's probably still in the cache and it's a cache hit. If it's a lot of code, it's probably been evacuated from the cache, and that's, then it's a cache miss. We have a struct called employee, which has an ID, age, few more fields, and salary. When we first access the ID, it's the first time that we access this address, and therefore it's a cache miss. We access age. Although it's the first time that we access it, it's adjacent to, the, to ID, which we already accessed. Therefore, it's probably on the same cache line, and therefore it's a cache hit. When we look at salary, again, we cannot say if it's a cache hit or a cache meet. It depends what hide behind this comment. If it's another integer, then fine, it's probably in the same cache line and then it's a cache hit. If it's many fields, then it's probably on a different cache line and it's a cache miss. We have a vector of integers and we're iterating over it, incrementing every item by one. First iteration, we have no reasons to believe that it's already in the cache, therefore it's a cache miss. Second iteration, it's adjacent to a, a location that we already touched, and therefore it's on the same cache line and it's a cache hit. And so in the next one, and probably the one after. But eventually we run out of the cache line. In this case, the hardware comes to help us, and it looks at our uh, accessing pattern, and let's say that we access uh, address 1000, 1010, 1030, it says, I know what you're doing. I bet you're gonna ask for address 1040, 1050, 1060 next. So it prefetches it for us before we even ask for it. That's the prefetches job, and it's extremely, extremely fast. So we are very unhappy, it's all cache lines, yes. I can... Uh, it's okay like this? <laughs> I know, uh, later on I'll start to get even more excited and, I'll, and the volume would be even more, so. I'm uh, sorry for the ear damages. Okay. It's a, okay. Okay, so if you're doing the same thing with list, First iteration, it's obviously a cache miss. Second iteration is also a cache miss because it's a different location. Third iteration is also a cache miss because again, it's a different location. The hardware cannot help us because it's random location in the memory. So it's all cache misses. We're now uh, accessing the vector, not contiguously, but at a constant stride, okay? So the first uh, assignment, it's a cache miss. We have no reasons to believe otherwise. The next one is also a cache miss, and probably the next one is also a cache miss. Soon enough, just a second, soon enough, the hardware will see our accessing pattern and start to prefetch it. And then it will start to be, and, and then we will have it. It will not be as fast as when we had contiguous uh, scan, because then for every cache line, we scanned all of it. Now for every cache line, we'll only take one integer, so we're really bound by the speed of the prefetcher. But it would be, it would be something like 50 to 70 percent uh, as fast as contiguous scan, much much faster than random scan. Yes. How much cache lines may be prefetched uh, by this uh, hardware optimization? I'm not sure. I think it's architecture dependent, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So here we are, 50 percent happy. It's not as good as contiguous, but it's definitely much much better than uh, list. Now, instead of a vector of ints, we have a vector of pointer to ints. So in every iteration, we have to do two operations, to fetch the, the pointer and then to dereference it. When we, in the first iteration, when we fetch the pointer, it's a cache miss. And then we de, when we dereference, it's a cache miss again. Then, like we discussed before, fetching the pointer would be cache hit, and then dereferencing is a cache miss. So in every iteration, we have a cache hit for fetching the pointer, 
and the cache miss for dereferencing it. Doing the same thing for list, cache miss for fetching the pointer, cache miss for dereferencing, and you got to love list. I mean, it's such an amazing thing. Really, I mean, you see list, you see, okay, excellent, I have an easy uh, optimization opportunity. So yes, you need to love them. So as a rule of thumb, whenever we have any memory access, we have to assume it's a cache miss, unless it's not, unless we have a very good reason to believe that it's not a cache miss. If I'm rereading the same address, the same memory location, it's a cache sheet. Unless it's been replaced, or it's been written to by other core, but this is something we are not going to discuss in this talk. As a consequence, the closer we are to the last time, the last access to a memory location, the closer we are, the more chances it still is in the cache, and therefore it's a cache hit. The further it is, the more chances it's already been evacuated, and therefore it's a cache miss. When I'm talking about near and far, I'm not talking about lines of code, and I'm not talking about CPU instruction. I'm talking about how much memory I read. So if I'm executing many instructions, but they're using the same amount of data, it can be considered uh, near. If you're doing less instructions, but every instruction fetches more memory, it's, it should be considered far. Reading a nearby location is a cache hit. And the closer the two addresses are to each other, the more chance there are that they're in the same cache line and the more chance it is on the same cache line and we get cache hit. That's why we like to group fields that we use together near each other, or even better, extract them to a different uh, dedicated uh, structure. It's called data programming and it's not in the scope of this talk. That's all that I'm going to talk about. I, it, as I said, it's not comprehensive model, it's not complete. We did not mention cache level associativity. I only mentioned that there is this concept of invalidation, but we didn't discuss it. We did not talk about pipelining, out of order execution, speculative execution, and a lot more. I think that as professional developers, we should all be very, very familiar with all this. I personally think it's extremely interesting, and we should all be familiar with it. There's plenty of materials about this uh, on the net. You should all look into it. But for practical reasons, for our practical reasoning about cash in our day-to-day -day job life, I think that what I described should suffice for the most cases. So the task that we're going to have today, what we're trying to write and implement, would be an expiring item container. The container will have a maximal size. Every time that we'll access an item in this container, will update the last access time, and either it will reach high watermark or uh, periodically will run the cleanup. The cleanup will obviously uh, remove the items that have been uh, accessed uh, the longest ago. If we did not clear enough item during this cleanup, we'll run aggressive aging, meaning we'll run the cleanup again with lower threshold. The API is going to be very simple. We're going to have only one uh, API call, get item, which will get the ID and return the item. Yes, I can, we can write more comprehensive, richer API, but for the purposes of this talk, I found no reason to clutter the code with, to, to add extra complexity. This API will suffice for the presentation. Now, this uh, container may look a bit artificial or a bit forced or something that I just made up for the presentation, but it's not. One use case for it would be, uh, we have a, a database which, hold, which holds, for example, customers' uh, data. When a customer logs into our system, we cache their data, and the uh, customer can update their data. Obviously, we do not want to always, every update that they do, to, f to write it into the database. That would be extremely slow. But we want to go one step further. We want to group updates of some customers together and flash them in, uh, in one go into the database. This will, write, will have a lot less writes to the database and uh, it will be a lot faster. So we'll use this container and during the flash of the oldest item, the items that, you know, the details of the customers that we didn't uh, see, didn't communicate with us for the longest time, 
Only then we'll flush it in the database. So we're basically grouping uh, the objects to the database. That could be one use case for this uh, container. Another use case is we'll have a server that connects to many devices and the devices should communicate uh, with the server every certain period of time. If device does not communicate with the server after a certain amount of time, it should be classed as dead and we should uh, disconnect it or uh, remove the connection. So we'll run the cleanup method uh, periodically and clean all the dead connections. Okay, so it is a useful uh, container. It's not something that I made up only for this talk. Some caveats. First of all, for simplicity, I did not implement the aggressive aging part. I only added it for completeness of the description of the container, but it had, adds no extra value when we're talking in, about uh, cache performance. So I saw no reason to write it. I concentrate on cache improvements only. I can think of many other improvements to this container, mainly to do with concurrency. I only concentrated about cache performance issues. Maybe in part three of this talk, I'll talk about concurrency. And probably most important, the code in the in these slides is written in slide-oriented programming, meaning the one, number one most important criteria of the code is that it would be short and would fit into one slide. Second most important criteria is that it would be very, very simple and correct. It's also kind of important, but the code is not there to show real programming habits and code that, nice coding style, it's only to demonstrate an idea of what I'm trying to do. So the container that you'll see is extremely intrusive. It assumes data fields in the data that it's sold. It's not even templated for simplicity. It, I will piggyback some of the fields and they'll have two meanings. It's not a good code, it's there only to demonstrate what I'm doing. As for benchmarking, I will generate many, many calls. Each call will be will have an ID, will ask for an item from the container. Um, I'll do some silly work on this, uh, on this item and go to the and ask for the next item. The container size will be 75% of all possible IDs. And also very important, no, I didn't present here all possible measurements. The amount of work that I'm doing, the, the uh, data, uh, the cache size, the data set size, the working set size, all will have very big difference, can impact the, the results very dramatically. I chose a representative uh, set uh, to demonstrate certain points, but yes, I know at some points I will say that if I'll change this, that on, or the other, the results may, di may be different. Yes. API to get the CPU size, I'm not familiar with one. There must be one because uh, different profilers do say the cache size. So there must be one, but from the top of my head, I can't really think about what it is. But there definitely is one because profilers do say, say to you. Yeah, yeah, but if I want to know the cache size. Uh, yeah, but uh, the code I'm going to, see, to show now would be cache oblivion. It will not depend on the different characteristics of the cache on the local machine. Okay? I take it that that's where you're going. That, that, that was the reason for your action. Uh, so let's start. I think that most of you, when I already described, when I just described the container, already had this uh, design. And the textbook solution or the interview solution would be to have a map which will map from the ID to the items, all the items will be in a linked list and the linked list would be a, a sorted in, a set, in an ascending access order. So when we'll want an item, we'll search for it on the map, get the item, update the accessing time and push it to the end of the list. This way we keep our uh, list in order. So when we want to clean up, we only need to start scanning from the beginning till we reach the first item that we did not need to evacuate. At this point, we know that all the items that will follow are at least as new as this item, and therefore those items also will not need to be cleaned, and they can be, and we can stop the cleanup. Okay, so we're only scanning and seeing the items 
that we want to, that we're going to remove. We're not scanning any, anything redundant. The code for this is very, very simple. Uh, we take the mutex, we search for the item with lower bound. If we did not find the item, we call the add item with the iterator that we found as a hint where to place it in the map. If we did find the item, we update the last access time, splice it to the end of the list, and return the item. When we want to uh, add an item, we place it in the front of the list, take the iterator to it, and place it into the map using the hint that we got while searching for it, call the cleanup method, and return the item. The cleanup method, I take the time, I calculate the threshold, take the iterator for the first item, which is the oldest item, and start to scan uh, the list. If I need to remove the list, I remove it from the map, remove it from the list, and take the iterator for the next item, which is now the new oldest item. Otherwise, I break. Not something really exciting, not something amazing, very simple code. But let's think about it for a second. I'm searching for an item. So that's the cache miss that I have to have. I'm searching for the item I have to access the map. I found the item, so I'm updating uh, the last access time. That's another cache miss. Again, something that I have to have. Then I'm moving it to the end. So the first thing that, I, that I'm doing is I'm extracting it from its current location. When I'm extracting it from its current location, I have to access the two IJ adjacent uh, cells, which is another two cache misses. And then I push it to the end, which is another cache miss. So I have cache miss, five cache misses here when I only wanted two. What if we will not do the reordering? What if we won't splice the list? I'm looking for the item that's a cache miss, updating it's another cache miss, two cache misses. On the other hand, when we scan, we have to scan the whole list. The code change, the difference is very, very minimal. This is exactly the same, updating exactly the same. I'm only removing the splice, I'm removing these two lines of code. Uh, the cleanup code, I just don't break. Okay? Benchmarking. I got 10% performance improvement. Now, if that doesn't make you extremely happy, there's something fundamentally wrong with you. I mean, you're definitely in the wrong profession, but there's something fundamentally wrong with you. We just did two of the, mo of the most important things. We simplified the code and we got performance improvement. And we didn't injure the correctness. So we should be happy about this. However, Exactly. That's one thing that I really hope to say, that I really hope to hear. I meant to say it and I forgot and I'm really glad that you mentioned it. That's part of what I said about not uh, showing the whole measurements. Right? Yes, it really depends. If I'm cleaning, if I, in one extreme, I'll clean the whole list, I'll get much better results than this. The, the performance improvement will be much better because I did not gain anything from the reordering. Right? I'm just doing less work. If, on the other hand, I'll, every time I'll I won't remove anything, the performance improvement would be much, much smaller. The reason I didn't, that I didn't show it is because this is two, these are two extreme cases. If I removed everything, then probably I, my threshold is too low. If I did not remove anything, I'll run aggressive aging, and then I will remove stuff. But again, it also indicates that my threshold, is, my, my threshold is too high. It will adapt very fast, but just on this uh, slide, just on this measurement, I could have shown like five different graphs, how many items I cleaned, the diff different time that I'm calling. If I'm calling it more often, then obviously this would be, uh, this will also affect it. So there, there are many variants here. So I took something that I think is, Normal case, removing something between 20 to 30 percent. That's what we'll normally do when we clean up, right? So yes, I could have, I could have delved a lot into these measurements, and that's a very good comment. But there's other stuff that I want to talk about, okay? 
Now, there should be something else that should annoy you in this code. <laughs> the list is really annoying, and we'll, we'll uh, discuss it in details later. But is there something else? I did not hint. It's something I said I will not talk about. No? I have to go through the tree right, but there's something that should annoy you here, and something that really, I, I said I did not talk about it. Concurrency. In the initial implementation, we always manipulated the data structures. At least we spliced the list. If we added, we also added an item to the, uh, to the map. Now we're not, in the normal case, when we have the item, we're not manipulating the, uh, the data structures. We're only reading it. So read uh, lock would be enough here, and we only need the writer lock when we add an item. And that should give us better concurrency, right? So if we're talking about concurrency, we're talking about multi-threading. So let's talk a bit about multi-threading benchmarking. The way that I chose to do it is that every thread will do the same amount of work. First of all, as all the others, and secondly, as it will do in one thread. So it doesn't matter how many threads there are, they'll do the same amount of work. So it means that two threads will do twice the amount of work as one thread, four threads will do four times the amount of work as one thread. So if they'll run sequentially, we expect to see that two threads will run twice slower than one thread. Four threads will run four times slower than one thread. If they run totally sequentially, one after the other. But you have common cache. I have common cache, yeah, yeah, but okay, instead of one thread does all of its work, then the second thread does all of its work. Fine? So I measured the, the speed up of both solution on one thread, two threads, and four threads, and we see that in most, that we always get quite constant uh, performance improvement. No, nothing amazing here, nothing really surprising. But if we we'll check the speed up of two threads compared to one thread, or four threads compared to one thread, we see something really surprising. We see that in two threads, we're doing twice the amount of work, but, uh, but it takes three times longer. Four threads, we're doing four times the amount of work, but we're seven times slower. So every operation takes us almost twice longer when we're doing four threads. And that's a bit surprising. I mean, we can understand why there is not no speed up. Just a second. Uh, we understand why there is no speed up because I didn't do enough junk work. So there, were, there is a very high contention on the lock. So there's many lock fails and then there's no speed up. But there's also something else, which is our data. Our working set is our data set. So it's very likely that I'll want to add an item. The container is full, so I'll clean up some uh, items. Just to clean up an item that I, in the next iteration I will have to re-add. Re so I'm constantly spinning around with the, the container and my cache hit rate is not very good. Thankfully, that's not how uh, data normally works. Someone logs into my system, does its work, and then disconnects, and I won't see him for a lot of time. So my working set is normally much, much smaller than my uh, data set, and my cache size can be at least the size of my working set, and then I'll get much higher hit rate. Here I get something like 75%, which is not very good uh, cache hit rate for container, for cache. But that explains why we didn't get speed up. It doesn't explain why uh, we didn't get, uh, why we got such a huge slowdown compared to um, compared to running it sequentially. What I try to show here is that every item or every data item, uh, the way that I wrote it, could appear anywhere along the test. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my data, the data that I'm actually working at any point of, uh, of time is my whole data set. Mm -hmm. But when you have a server, not everyone connects to you at the same time. Some people connect now, and then they disconnect, and you won't see them for three days, and so your, your working set, the data that you're actually working on, is much, much smaller than all possible data set. 
And that's what I try to show you because you normally want your data set, your cache to be at least the size of your working set. In order to understand why it takes longer, we have to look a bit into profiling. We see that in single thread, we're doing something like 14 billion instructions. In four threads, we're doing, we're doing four times the amount of work, but it takes us eight times the amount of instructions. If you look a bit closer, we'll see that in one thread, we got 39 uh, context switches, and in four threads, we're doing seven million context switches. I think that you should, it won't come as a great surprise why we have so many context switches. So it's very important to remember, when you have a log fail, it's actually extremely expensive. It's not just that this thread is being slowed down. It's actually the CPU is executing a lot more work. And if we'll take, in this case, it's doing a lot of extra work, and in this case, if it will let one thread do all of its work, then they let the other thread do all of its work, and then the third and the fourth do all of the work, we got almost double the, the performance. We'll play with latency, but we'll get much better performance. So we can maybe balance it and do 100, say, 100 calls each, and then we'll balance the amount of uh, log fail, we'll reduce the amount of log fails and won't insert su such uh, dire uh, latency. Something to remember, we normally like to take the log for as little as possible, but now if we'll do also the junk work inside the log and do another iteration, another iteration, that will actually increase our performance. And I think that's quite interesting. A uh, couple of points to remember. Um, we need, when we are writing the test, the route will uh, run our program. We need to think about the data accessing pattern and how much work we are actually going to do because too little work uh, will do artificial load on our uh, artificial uh, contention or on our locks. Too much work will re reduce the amount of work that we're doing that is also really just the wrong re uh, results. But this is less, all this is less relevant for uh, the cache. Uh, so we'll, I will not discuss this any further. Now that we talked about uh, multi-threaded multi benchmarking, let's go for a little detour and try to uh, write the read writer log. So here I'm just taking the reader log, search for the item. If I found the item, I'm updating it and returning it. Otherwise, outside the scope of the log, I'm adding the item. In the add item, I'm taking a writer lock, searching for the item like before, and then adding the item uh, just like before. Cleanup method is exactly the same, only difference is that I removed the comment. And we look at it and we see that we got performance degradation. So where the cycle goes? We actually changed three things. We changed the lock type, we did some extra work, and then we change the locking scheme. Instead of taking one lock in the beginning, we take a reader lock, and if needed, we're taking a writer lock. So let's measure how much each one of them cost. But before we check how much changing the lock type cost, let's check how much just acquiring a lock cost. Okay? In order to do this, I ran it on a single thread uh, with no lock and with lock. Now, common knowledge is that uh, acquiring a log that succeeds is free. It's next assignment to an int. It's not really expensive. It's something really, really cheap. And this is the result that I've got. Now, I must say, this surprised me. It's something like 5% and I'm doing the work. I mean, we're searching for the item. We're updating the data structures. Um, we're doing some junk work that's not enormous, but it's quite a bit of work. I mean, there are a lot of function calls and complicated function calls, and we're doing work, and still 5% is just for acquiring the lock. And I must say that's surprised before log that always succeeds. So I zoomed into this, and there are mainly two parts that I want to distinguish between. We all know that every lock should have at least, every synchronization mechanism should have at least one fence. So in the beginning, I just added the fence. Remove the lock, just added the fence, and that's the light blue. 
Then I removed the fence and added the lock, and that's the darker blue. So if we remove the lock and use lock free, the most we can hope for is to reduce the cost by 50%. So maybe it's worth it, but maybe, maybe it's not, because sometimes we actually, have, when we're changing to lock-free, we have to do some extra work. So maybe that would cost us the difference. Very important to remember, I think. Now, replacing the lock, again, I was surprised here. I don't know if you can see it here. There is a very thin uh, purple line. I thought it would be a bit uh, broader, but that's the way, uh, what it cost us. That's the extra work that we're doing, the researching, and uh, changing the locking scheme. Changing the locking scheme is kind of obvious. Instead of taking one lock, we're taking two locks. It's quite obvious that it would cost us. But I think that the main thing that we have to learn from this is that the main thing that cost us here, the main cycle, the, the main thing that costs us is the extra work, the extra search that we have to do. So if we want to improve this, we shouldn't really bother with the locking. We should decrease the amount of extra work that we're doing. For example, let's add a transaction ID that would be increased every time that we add an item. If uh, by the time that we acquire, uh, if we, it did not change between searching for the item with the reader lock to acquiring the writer lock, we know that we don't need to scan again for the item. And therefore, we don't need to do all the extra work. We can just assume that, no, that it's still not in our cache. So that would be a way to decrease the amount of extra work. But we didn't do it for a single thread. We didn't expect uh, changing reader lock, uh, the mutex to read write lock to give us any improvement on a uh, single thread. We expected it to, to, to help us on multi-threaded, right? Everyone agrees that we should get better performance on multi-threaded? That's what I got. Performance have died. <laughs> Committed suicide on uh, false trade. It's something like 60% performance degradation. And that's something I have to say I didn't really see coming. <laughs> that's something that really surprised me. So yes, I know that's a slide baiting. If I had higher cash hit rate, I would get better results. Something like 90%, which is a normal hit rate for cash, minimal hit rate for a cash. I, get, I will get better result using reader write lock. That's a concurrency issue. It's, it doesn't really matter, but there still is something to learn. Most people that I showed this to said, yes, of course, what do you want? With 75%, you're not having one order of magnitude more reads than writes. You shouldn't use write a lock. Let's challenge this. We're looking at one thread, and comp let's compare uh, having a write a lock to reader write a lock. We so say it's about the same, the same amount of instructions and the same amount of cache misses. No real surprise. We didn't do an awful lot more work. Fourth rate, we, do, we see that we do four times the amount of work, so we have four times the amount of cache misses. Understandable. We said we have a lot more uh, instructions, but we already saw why. The interesting part is when we're comparing the reader writer lock in four threads to, four, to writer lock with four threads. We say we do the same amount of instructions, but we have many more cache misses. And that's the cause for the degradation. And if you think about it, it's very logical. We search for the item in the beginning, see that we don't have this item, so trying to acquire a writer lock will obviously fail because other threads have the reader lock, so we have to wait. Right? By the time we got the right lock, all of our cache has been invalidated. So we have to search again for this item, and it's another cache misses. So obviously, we'll get much higher uh, amount of cache misses. So it's very important to remember that cache misses, that this, sorry, uh, lock failures also causes cache invalidation. Okay, so again, if we'll decrease the amount of uh, work that we're doing, we'll use less cash, and then we should get uh, better performance. Let's actually do it. It's something that I just added. I'm just adding the transaction that I, I implemented the transaction, so I'm getting the transaction uh, number 
from the tester. And if only if it, it's not the same, I'm searching for it. If it's the same, I'm skipping this whole search. I'm adding it and placing it exactly the same. And I see that I got no performance improvement. So you look at it and you think either Yossi is lying or Yossi does not know what he's talking about or there's something else that we're missing. I'm looking at it and I know that I'm not lying. I hope that I know what I'm talking about. So I hope that there's something here that I missed and I stare it for a few more seconds and I look, hold my head and think, oh God, I'm an idiot. I'm just in placing it. So the in placing have to search again for the item. So just instead of searching it on the top, I'm searching it here when I'm in placing. So I actually did nothing. If on top of that, I'll get, I'll get the hint like before and I'll do the same and in place with hint. Now I did not add the benchmarking because I only added it, but all the performance degradation has vanished. Okay? Although we're not doing enough work and although we have low cache hit rate, we still get performance improvement even with this uh, condition which is really suboptimal for reader writer locks. Someone asked, but what about the list? Why do you need the list now? I mean, in the beginning, the list served a purpose. In the beginning, we used the list to start to not scan the whole, amount, the whole items, but now we're not using it. We're scanning the whole items anyway. So why do you need it? Let's just use a map. Code is probably as simple as a code can be. Searching for the item, if I uh, did not find it, I'm calling the add, otherwise I'm updating the code and returning the item. I only added this as a slide, not implemented it in the same function for consistency with the rest of the slides, but really can't be simpler. Cleanup, also even without C++20, we'll have to handcraft the in place if really as simple as it can be. And we look at it and we see something quite interesting. We see that in one thread we got performance improvement. Two threads, it's kind of balances, and in four threads we got performance degradation. Obviously, when we're searching for an item, we're much faster now. We're doing the, the same work that we did before. We're doing every work that we did before, we, that we're doing now we did before, but we're doing a bit less. So that's faster. But the scanning is a lot slower. So when we're doing one thread, scanning, the slower scanning is holding one thread. And the performance gain that we got from the adding is higher than the performance degradation that we got in the scanning. And that's why we got performance, performance improvement. When we're using two threads, when I'm cleaning, I'm holding two threads now. So this delta of performance uh, degradation that I got in the cleanup is magnified by two. And that's why it kind of balances each other. In four threads, whoa. Okay, sorry, you just don't me that I have 10 minutes. In four threads, I'm doing, uh, I'm holding up four threads and therefore uh, we got performance degradation. So okay, we understand that we need another container, but why list? Let's use a vector instead. Now vector, obviously the scanning would be a lot, a lot faster, but we'll have a problem when we want to clean uh, item. We can't just shift everything to the left, right? <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll uh, use a free list. We'll initialize the, the vector so that every cell will point into the next cell. What it's actually pointing at is at the next free cell. We'll also have a pointer pointing to the first cell, which what it really points to is at the first free cell. So when we want to write to an item, we look at where this, the first free cell uh, pointer points to, write to it, make first free cell points to where this cell points to, and remove the link. So we wrote into few cells, and now we want to reclaim this second cell. So we make this cell points to where first free cell points to and make first free cell point into this cell. Fair enough. Uh, 
the get item code exactly the same. The insert code, the new cell index where we're actually going to write on is where first free cell points to. First free cell will get the index of the next free cell, which is piggybacked by ID. ID is now used for the ID or uh, next cell. I told you it's not a nice code. I'm writing the item into this cell, in placing it into the map and calling the cleanup method. When I want to clean up, do all the calculations like before, I need to distinguish between a cell that holds a valid item to a free cell. So I'm piggybacking another uh, field, the last, uh, the last access. If it's zero, it means it's a free uh, cell. If it's a positive number, it's a valid a cell, a valid item. So I'm checking if it's positive, therefore it's a real item. And I need to clean it because the last access time is below our threshold. I'm removing it from the map. Uh, make it point into where first free cell points to at the moment. Make the last uh, access zero to flag that it's a free cell. And first free cell gets the index of this cell. Okay, exactly what we saw on the animation. And what we see here is that we got on one thread the same uh, performance, and in four threads we got a slight performance improvement. However, there is a slight nuance here, very subtle nuance. In Vector, when we used Vector, we got better performance, but we got 170,000 cache misses. When, with map only, we got a slightly worse uh, results, but we only got 150,000 cache misses. That means that the vector will interfere more with the rest of our program. It will invalidate more of our cache than the map only. So it's, yeah. so it's very possible that on a real, uh, on the real application, it's very possible that the map only will behave better. And that's something that we have to remember. We, when we micro-benchmark, it does not tell us anything about the way that our module interacts with the rest of the program. So, okay. We realized that for the insert and for the search, we want only map. That was the facet. It was the simplest code. It's really good. But for the cleanup, we wanted to somehow for collapse into a vector. It looks really nice on the animation. Actually, it's very, very simple. There's no code here because I don't have time, um, but it's actually extremely, extremely simple. We use the same code as we used for map, but instead of using STD allocators, we'll use our own custom allocator. The allocator will use vector of nodes as a pool. The vector would be managed in, in exactly the same way as we managed the vector that we just saw. So when we want to insert or search, we'll use it with the map. When we want to scan, we'll scan the vector. When we find an item that we want to remove, we'll remove it normally from the map. And this is the performance that we got. Now the nice thing about this is that the code is not more complicated. It's actually most of the code, the code that actually manages the data structures is the simplest code that we saw. It's the code of the map, as simple as it can be. And yes, we have the allocators, which is not a, a very nice code. It's not very complicated. No one looked at me weirdly when I showed it to you on the, on, on the vector. It's not such an ugly code. It's not nice, but, but also it's out there. It's concealed. It's confined in its own place. So it's very easy to reason about. It's not like in the vector it was really entwined with the logic of the container. It's out there. We write it once, row test for it, because it's very easy to write test for it, and we don't touch it again, ever. So we got a really nice code and much, much better performance. It's something like 50% x2 uh, than the code. With so final few words, first of all, in this presentation, I tried to show how we can improve performance just by inspecting the code and without using special tools or without even using special data structures or something highly complicated. We only use STL containers. Nothing really sophisticated here. 
A few words about the process measure, always. I like to measure stuff, all this sort of stuff, just because I enjoy it. On rainy weekends, I just sit in front of my computer and measure this sort of stuff. In case you wondered, yes, I'm real fun at parties. I was still surprised uh, by a few things here. So always measure. And when you measure, measure one thing at a time. If you're measuring a few things, it's very likely that one thing would be improvement and another thing would be uh, degradation and they'll cancel each other or you'll, one will outshine the other and then you'll either miss a good performance opportunity or you'll introduce a degradation. Not less important, make sense of the results. We saw in this uh, presentation we got a huge performance degradation that everyone kind of understood about when with the reader writer lock. We didn't get enough cash sheet. So reader writer lock is not suitable. Why? When we actually looked into it and understood what's going on, we managed even with this cash sheet rate to understand what's going on and to do get performance improvement. Finally, micro benchmarking is good. It's extremely good. It's a very useful tool, but it has its limitations. Some of the limitations we discussed, the way that we run our module, the data set that we choose, the accessing pattern, the extra work that we're doing will have a tre tremendous effect on our results. And also, not less important, it doesn't tell us anything about the way that our container or our module that we're benchmarking, how it interacts with the rest of the program. So we need to measure it and to, to keep an eye on it. And if you see something a bit fishy, like you have more cache misses like we saw here, measure it with the real application. Because micro benchmarking, that's its limit. It tests in isolation. How many times they test uh, This is Perth, stat. It's simply the best. I, there's nothing that compares to it, in my opinion. I didn't put a thank you note, but so I thank you all for listening to me and bearing with me at this time. And I didn't put a question the slide, but you're all welcome to ask questions. <laughs> you want to ask? Yes. Okay, the question was why do I not use spin lock instead of mutex? Uh, a few reasons. First of all, uh, because I want to talk about uh, cache and spin lock does not help. Secondly, uh, normal imple most implementations of, uh, of mutex spins a bit before it actually locks. And with spin lock that only spins, you have a very high risk of someone acquiring the lock and having a context switch. And then you try to acquire it and you just waste all of your time slice uh, spinning. <laughs>